With outstretched arms, the Asquani, the tree people, embraced the sun. They danced with the excitement of this new day. Raven calls out, the trickster is awake. His wings open, reaching for the stars, the moon, the sun. He swims in the fresh daylight that has arrived. I am here to witness the beauty of your creation. Share with me the wisdom. Share with me the knowledge. Share with me the love. Raven calls out. I hear the voices of my ancestors whispering. I listen. I listen as it echoes from another time, another place. I listen. Raven calls out. I look to the east. With outstretched arms, Grandmother Moon smiles bright. Her light, reflecting through the trees, drapes me like a blanket, warms me. I look above, and in the midnight sky, the auroras are dancing, dancing, dancing. In the light of the moon, under one sky, all is well. All is well. All is well. I think the, the glass brings another dimension to Native American art or indigenous, you know, cultural art. So that's another thing that I've been a big advocate of, you know, working with other indigenous cultures, collaborating with people. And so I would hope that, you know, it would, it would you know, draw people in. And I think that it has because, it, it, you know, when I first showed in glass galleries, um, you know, I was able to sort of have my foot in the door already. And, you know, then people would be exposed to my work and, and potentially, I mean, I always felt that I wished that people could be attracted to it for reasons other than, you know, the ethnic aspect of the work. But at the same time, it's what gives it its power. So there's, there's kind of a duality there. I try to put every effort that I can to bring some kind of a spirit to the piece in terms of the historical, you know, this, this continuity that I've been working with, uh, trying to bring these old symbols you know, into a new you know, material. And, and I feel as though one of the things I feel about the glass is that it has an in, inner glow to it. I like to think of it as having a spirit to itself that is revealed when the light is, the lighting conditions are right. Over. Okay. I 
I'm a member of the Tlingit tribe, and they come from the Alaska region, southeast Alaska. You know, some of the things that, that historically, there was two ways of looking at it. You had crest art, which represented the, the families, kind of like a coat of arms. And then uh, some of the, the more expressive work was usually made by shaman or made for them. These little amulet forms and things like this are, are generally maybe illustrating some kind of a vision that the shaman would have had. And those are the things, I like to draw on those kinds of ideas, not that they represent any particular specific vision that I've had, but that whole interaction and it alludes to the fact that there is a spiritual aspect of the, of the culture and that's what I try to bring into that, those particular pieces. There was a time when uh, Native people were punished for displaying their crest art and celebrating their culture. They were um, sent to boarding schools in the late 19th, early 20th centuries and um, punished for speaking their language. Uh, they were converted to Christianity and made to feel ashamed of their culture. And the very fact that that period of, of uh, repression happened makes it all the more meaningful today when people are able to show their crests and, and uh, be proud of their culture. And many of our people have suffered but they hung on to that artwork. They hung on to the designs, they hung on to that spirit. And now, like today, the artists of today are bringing that spirit to the people. I think some people have equated what I do with cashing in on my culture, generally from non-native people. Most of the people that have seen what I do, especially from the native community, both you know the Clinket community and the bigger uh, native community from around the country, are usually supportive, if not at first sort of surprised. You know, I think what I do sort of comes out of left field for most people because it's such an unusual process, and the, the results are kind of surprising, I guess. He executes these pieces you know, just so beautifully they're, they're absolutely stunning to to see them in that kind of context and to see them in the, the fine art context is, is really wonderful the fact that it's on view that brings it into like a public awareness and instead of being invisible all of a sudden it is visible and you do have to talk about those things about culture and about uh, how people are represented today Just simply being around her was really an experience. Because the Clinket culture is, such, is a matrilineal society, she was the matriarch of the family. My great-grandmother was raised in Sitka, Alaska. Her name is uh, Susie Johnson. She, she was very, very proud of her, her culture. I mean, she just had this really spirit, this very sagey kind of spirit to her. She talked a lot about where she came from. She gave us stories about the, the early days when she, uh, the things that were told to her as a child and the stories that she passed on to us. So she was around in our life until 1981. And now when I, when I think back on, on go, those visits and that connection, 
those are the things that I, you know, I try to, to reach back and, and pull that feeling out and just knowing that, you know, that she, you know, went through, you know, enormous change in her lifetime. My great-grandfather was killed in a, a sawmill accident in 1919 and she was left with five children, I believe, and uh, so she went for you know a few years. She met a, uh, a Filipino man who she fell in love with, and his name was Dionysius Gubatayo. He had traveled the world, and he ended up in Alaska working in the canneries and the fishing industry, and decided he wanted to settle down. So um, they decided to leave the community. In the mid 20s, they moved to Seattle. Um, and from that point forward, the whole family grew up in the Seattle area. But at that time, it was really, uh, it wasn't respected, this intermarrying. It was to marry outside of your culture. But because uh, my great-grandmother Susie was such a strong-willed woman, she, you know, she just left and she wanted to look for, uh, you know, a, b a better way of life than you know, getting away from the community, I guess. The press has an uncanny ability of working the material, the hot goo. As far as working glass, press is a very, very calm, really flows with the material like, like no other artist I know. He lived right down the street from the studio here, just a couple of blocks, and so we were friends pretty much straight away. No, I don't believe either of us were really standouts in anything, you know, at school, but um, we were both kind of creative individuals, and um, we've stuck to it. <laughs> I think everybody realized when Dante moved to town, he had a lot of charisma. He was like this California guy, and he was kind of had this funny way of talking, has this really sort of dark and gravelly voice, and he had all these funny things that he, you know, that all this lingo that he brought up from California, which kind of spread like wildfire through the school, and we all started finding ourselves saying these. He's primo and everything was fresh and... I think my dad kind of influenced Preston just, you know, outwardly by exposing the both of us to the world in which he, you know, um, was in professionally. It was quite a time because, you know, Paul Marioni, who was the, the first glass artist I ever met, you know, and I, I saw... Uh, his studio and I saw some of his work and he was making this big window of these cast glass figures and so we were uh, and it was like a big giant mural or something in, in cast glass with these two boxers and and so it was wow you know that was a really cool thing so it was my first exposure to glass and all the kids from the Lincoln High School use this building as kind of their playground because the whole building was empty. So they, after school, they'd come here and race their bicycles. And one room was 5,000 square feet. They had an indoor bicycle racing track. And then because of Pilchuck, a lot of artists from around the world would come by. In fact, for a while, we called this building Hotel Pilchuck because it seemed like everybody that went to Pilchuck stayed before or after their session 
here. So Preston certainly got exposed to a lot of different types of artists. Dante got me started in the glass world and, you know, got me my first job. You know, we were really tight friends and so we, we, we decided that, you know, this was an opportunity that we could, you know, develop our skills side by side and be able to hang out together and everything. So we, you know, we watched uh, Lino when he came to town and picked up these techniques of goblet making. And in the first few years, I was kind of his main assistant. We bounced ideas off each other, techniques, and you know, we really relied heavily on each other to, to help with certain aspects of the blowing. Glass blowing to me was what I was going to do with my life. And for Preston, it was a cool job to support his music habit for a long time. nightlife as a musician and being up all hours but somehow would come straggling in always ten, five or ten minutes late couldn't get there five minutes earlier I really thought in early on in in the first number of years in working with Preston this was a kid that was going to be lost and be searching his whole life for what he wanted to do he was looking for his voice so to speak. He was trying to do that clean Swedish design, which really wasn't his character. He was good enough at it, but it wasn't going to grow and develop for him. I mean, after all, the Swedish designers do it better. <laughs> Preston and I met in the summer of 1993. I was pretty fortunate to uh be able to travel with Lino to Scandinavia. I was uh, an assistant to Lino, Dante and I went, and you know, so we were doing demonstrations in Sweden and Finland, and. I actually think that when Preston and I met at the first time, it was love at first sight. He um, has very nice, soft eyes. The, uh, one part, of, one trip that worked out pretty well for me. <laughs> when Preston and I met, and how he moved, he actually decided to come and stay with me. During that time, I was a graduate student from Beckman School of Design, and I was working for Gunnar Salin. He became, in press and in articles, he became my American glassblower. In reality, Preston considers his collaborations with Osa his, his first, his first co true collaboration. I think that I raised his bar within himself that it needed to be perfect. That's probably been my biggest Thing to him that you gotta you can't have expectation on others if you don't have higher expectations on yourself. It taught him the way a designer works, that he could then go on and create designs that he would execute or have others execute for him, and that he could create a much larger body of work through various series. So one night when we were working at my show, I came home really late one night and I said to him, you know, press. I think that we can go back to Seattle and you continue with your path because he had a path. And he just didn't know, he just needed to get back and get on it again. The whole reason that I, I delved into doing the Clinkett design work on the glass was trying to discover my own voice with the material. I mean, in the very beginning, I you know copied things out of books and I really, it was sort of reinventing myself, you know, being you know, becoming a painter or whatever, you know, after being a sculptor. It was a hard transition. The learning curve was really steep. I took workshops from people like Steve Brown and Dwayne Pascoe, and I initially brought my work to people like Marvin Oliver and Israel Shotridge, and, you know, just to, to show people what I was doing. Everybody was very encouraging. So eventually when I learned how to really design things on my own, it became much more liberating. And then this is the same process that I use in all of my work, or covering it with the rubber tape, drawing out the design and cutting out the areas that I want to be carved. And then uh, with the sandblasting process, just set about wearing the surface of the, of the glass down and carving it. That's why I refer to it as sand carving. 
you know, because then it also kind of relates to the, the tradition of wood carving. These elements, uh, the way that they're constructed are really what make the art what it is. That's what makes it recognizable as Northwest Coast art. And of course, you know, you've got this blowhole here, and the, and but it's also, it's built into the dorsal fin. And so um, that's just one of the ways that you can play with these elements. You're showing a three-dimensional thing. You're representing it in a two-dimensional uh, space. And so therefore you're looking at different elements of the animal you're, and, and it, can, it could be said that you're looking at the underside, you're looking at the side, you're looking at, and, but it's all arranged into a flat example. That all happened at a very magical, magical time up at Pilchuck. Joe David, a spiritual man and a remarkable artist from British Columbia who came to Pilchuck as an artist in residence and made a huge impact on press. I mean, really opened his eyes to his culture. That was in 2000. If you look at my work pre-Joe David and post-Joe David, I mean, all of his input to what it is that I do is reflective in everything that I do today. I think that my intent was, was recognized by Joe and he kind of supported me in that way. He told me that it was one of the things he wanted to do was to, to build a sweat lodge up on the campus because he was going to be missing his, his ceremonies. We did a, called a morning lodge, so we went in at like two in the morning and when we come out, uh, we emerge from the, the sweat lodge of the ceremony. It's morning and it's sort of like a rebirth. And that evening, he, he adopted me and shared his name with me, and that was one of the, I mean, that was one of the biggest things he could have given me. Especially on the Northwest Coast, you're given names at different points within your lifetime. It, it sort of a, reflects a change or a growth within your own life, and, and also responsibility. I have a responsibility to that name that he shared with me, which was Kakawan Chief, and it means a transforming killer whale. And it's an artist's name that comes from his tribe, the Nuchanov. And so that was uh, you know, something that I, that I carry with me. And it, it's something that can be taken away as well. But it's something that you carry with you. And it's a responsibility as well. My Clinket name is Cochain. And uh, it was given to me by my great grandmother. Um, and I'm honored to have uh, some of my family uh, standing by me today. is you know very special to me. I feel like I learned everything I know about artwork through this place. And so I feel like a product of the school.